Sydney's just come through a pretty dreary wet spell, but nothing to match what happened just over a year ago. A day that brought the heaviest downpour in a century. Flash floods hit a number of suburbs and caught up in one of them, a family that lost two children. Little sisters swept away after their car was swamped. It was a tragedy that made a city cry. People opening their hearts with offers of sympathy and support, including money, to the mother and her de facto husband. An inquest into the children's drownings has just been wound up, the case virtually closed. But that might change after what you see tonight. New evidence the police and the coroner never heard. I thought for a second there that I was driving beside the ocean and I heard all this water coming from nowhere. And I just took a quick uh, look and seeing all this water coming towards me. And then within seconds it um, hit the car, rocked at something bad like a couple of people were on the side pushing it from side to side. Mark Newman, his de facto wife Pam Carrick and their two little girls, Cindy Lee and baby Raylene. A Christmas photograph of a happy family. Less than a year later, the heavens opened over Sydney and washed this family away. The torrents of rain that drenched Sydney closed dozens of roads in the city and suburbs. August 5th, 1986, will be remembered as the day Sydney drowned. Freak weather conditions, the experts say, happen once in a century. Mark Newman and his family set off for a night out at the Bowls. It was a regular Tuesday night and you can't let the team down. Um, a bit of loyalty there. And um, so we just took them with us and we went our normal route. Was Pam happy to go and take the children? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that was virtually the only night that we ever went out. One of the saddest incidents... Mark Newman never got to the, to the bowls Mary that night. Sydney siders, trapped in their homes, watched their televisions in horror as they were told Cindy Lee and little Raylene had become casualties. The two little girls had disappeared into the dark waters less than five minutes' drive from the family home. Their car ambushed by a flash flood, Mark Newman had lost his children only metres from higher ground and safety. She had to be taken to hospital. That's it, girl. I think um, Cindy let go of me. She had her arms under me, chin hanging on. And I think she let go and must have fallen off the back of me. Do you remember her falling off? Do you remember that feeling? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember it, but it's, um, it was very hard at the time because um, when I fell over, I was also being pushed downstream. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I let go of the baby. In everyone's eyes, a tragic accident. But that accident suddenly turns into a murky mystery. Pam Carrick, the children's mother, goes back to the police to tell them what she claims is the real story of what happened. She was forced to go out that night and she claims Mark Newman is responsible for the deaths of Cindy Lee and Raylene. When he got the kids out of the car, he put Cindy on his shoulders and he had Raylene in his arms. He said, I don't like your daughters. Pam's statement provokes a coronial inquiry and the coroner comes up with this surprise finding about the children's deaths. I can't say on the balance of probabilities the deaths were accidental. The coroner also says he cannot accept parts of Mark's testimony. His story that he gave the police certainly makes it very hard for me to accept what he says as being the truth. Are you prepared to say that everything you've said about what happened that day and that night is the truth? Yes, I am. No exceptions? No exceptions at all. She said, you kill my kids. And I just said, what are you, you, know, what are you talking about? And so she just took her glasses off and just started to tell me from the beginning, you know, what happened. Mary Maroney, a close friend of Pam Carrick. Pam went to her first with her allegations about Mark. Well, I don't believe it was an accident, to tell you the truth. I just don't believe that. I can't believe that. I never have since I've heard that it happened. Nancy Higginson, Pam Carrick's sister. He wanted to tell the world about how bad he had been done by because he lost his kids. Paul Carlin, at the time of the floods, he was one of Mark's closest friends. But crucial to this mystery story is Pam Carrick, Mark Newman's then de facto wife and mother of the dead children. 
According to her, just before Cindy Lee and Raylene drowned, Mark told her he hated the children. They said he, oh, I, I don't like your kids. I hate, you. I hate your kids. So he said. Did you say anything to him? I said to Mark, don't say that to my daughters at all. Talk to Pam and you begin to realise one of the reasons why this case is still unresolved. Her sister Nancy explains. Well, she is a bit backward and, you know, as people say, you know, with him being like that, he more or less overruled or whatever he said went. You say, you use the word backward. What she's you... a bit slow, you know, she's sort of, I mean, like in school and that, she was in a special class and things like that. So she's the sort of person who's easily influenced? Very easily, yes. I feel that I'm probably still being blamed by her family and that they can't accept that it was a, a tragic accident. Her family thinks you're responsible for what happened? Yes. But she's the one who's saying all these things. Why would she change her story so much? I probably can't remember exactly what happened that night. But Mark Newman himself has trouble remembering what happened that night. What you're about to hear is his story and how it changes in a number of crucial areas, from the weather conditions that night to an insurance policy he took out on one of the children. But first, the most basic question of them all, just whose children were they? In his first statement to police, Newman said Cindy Lee was his stepdaughter, but Raylene, the baby, was his. He confirmed that in the first of two interviews with us. Were they your children? Uh, yeah, yeah, the baby was. The baby was your child? Yeah. Right. But as it turns out, that was the untrue. Coroner. In your first interview with the police, you told them that one of the children who was living in your house was your own child. Was that the truth? Uh, no, they were both de facto to me. So why did you lie to the police in the first place? Um, because that first statement was done um, just a few weeks um, after it all happened and I think I just misunderstood his question at the time. But you told me that too in an earlier interview. Mm, I probably did the same thing. I probably didn't realise what you were saying. I think it was a very plain question. Mm. And I'm sorry if I misunderstood you. So you've misunderstood that question twice now, once from the police and once from me? Yes. Do you really think that's believable? Well, no, but these things do happen. The next area of doubt in Mark Newman's account is how he spent the day of August the 5th and with whom. You sure you were repairing cars? I was repairing cars. Where were you repairing cars? In Tregear, in Mount Druitt. At a friend's place? At a friend's place. Who were those friends? Um, Paul Carlin. Now, why do they say that you weren't there at all? They haven't been found. The police can't locate him. I've spoken to them. You've spoken to him. Well, I'm sure Mount Druid Police would like to speak to him too. We found Paul Carlin and his wife Debbie. They're certain they didn't see Mark Newman at all that day and only briefly that night. Does it surprise you to know that he says he spent part of the day at least at your place fixing a car? It does surprise us. <sighs> Very much. He wasn't there? He wasn't there, no. I don't think we were even there. We weren't even home. Mm -hmm. So two eyewitnesses call Mark Newman a liar. He's already told police conflicting stories about the children. Now another conflict. How does Newman remember the weather on what's been called one of Sydney's worst nights? The um, Weather Bureau says that kind of heavy rain over a whole day would happen only once in a hundred years. Well, it's still able to, um, to be driven in, and if you've got to go to um, a place, um, you jump in your car and go. You don't give a second thought about the weather. That's what wipers were invented for. Newman claims he had no idea Sydney was flooding, even though the media was saturated with alarming reports. Did you see any news reports, any television reports about the flooding? No, none at all. Didn't see any TV or listen to any radios that day at all. You're absolutely certain of that? I'm positive. Remember the Carlins, the couple Mark claimed to have spent most of that day with and didn't. 
Once again, they say Mark Newman is lying. When Newman did arrive at their house later that evening, it was just in time to watch a television report of the floods, a report they watched together. Less than two hours later, Mark Newman drove his family into the big wet. He saw it on TV there in, in our house in the, because in our the, there was a news report on about the flooding then uh, and there was comments made and there was some pictures uh, from memory. Are you absolutely sure he saw that news report? Paul? Yes, I am. We said, I look. <laughs> it's pretty hard not for someone not to see something when you say, look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so there couldn't have been any doubt in his mind about the weather that night? I don't think so. No. I'd say that's a lie. That's a lie. Are you absolutely certain you're telling me the truth? I am positive. Matter of fact, I like to front poor Carlin myself. As we've already seen, some gaping holes in Mark Newman's account of events in relation to the weather, what he did that day, even whose children they were. Now there's the question of an insurance policy he took out on 10-month-old Raylene just four weeks before she died. The insurance agent who sold him that policy takes up the story, beginning with a phone call from Newman the day after the children died. He told me his name as soon as I answered and um, I thought that he was ringing to tell me about the death of the children, but he didn't mention that. He asked how they go about getting the money, the insurance money. That's Patricia Munro says this was the first of four phone calls she took from Newman demanding insurance money. What really got me angry was he said if Cindy would have fell off a slippery dip and split her head open on cement and died, I would have expected to get money for that. Without telling you what had happened? He didn't mention the drowning or the deaths. He, it was, that really struck me. As it turns out, the insurance policy on Raylene didn't cover her death. But that didn't stop Mark Newman trying to get nearly $100,000 the day after the children died. There's also been a suggestion that, that you called the insurance agent about that insurance policy no. soon after the accident. No, I did not. Newman was living with his friends, the Carlins, at the time, and they confirm he made a number of calls to the insurance agent. It was one of his main thoughts. You know, the insurance covers there, the insurance covers there. You know, I've got to get this insurance cover through. That's 90,000 bucks. You told me the other day that you didn't call the insurance agent the day after the children's deaths. No, I did not. You stand by that? I still stand by that. But there are a number of people who say that in the period after the children's deaths, you spoke a lot about the insurance money that was due to you. No, well, I don't remember any of that. Don't remember? No. Do you want to sit and think about it and try and remember? Yes. And suddenly, it all comes back to him. Just he did call out. the insurance agent. I remember talking to her a couple of days afterwards, but not a day after. He just said, at least we've got the insurance cover there and that's, that'll give us $90,000 to start again. That statement to the Carlins, just hours after the children's deaths, and where did he say it? He said to us at the hospital, just after they'd finished telling us the story, when they'd sort of settled down, told the story, then that comment came out. Did that strike you as strange? Very strange. <laughs> I was actually stunned. Um, I looked straight at Paul at the time, I don't know what was going through Paul's mind, but I know what was going through mine, but um, it did seem rather strange, and Pam even looked at me. I think she was surprised that he said it too. Uh, well, the wall of water just uh, pushed it off the road. If you can, We took Mark you can Newman the back to the, the spot road. where he says he lost the, the children that night. Once again, there are a number of inconsistencies in his story. No, Listen to no, just one. I, well, I lost the children and I was upset and couldn't see them or hear them. Um, there's not much I remember because I, I just blacked out after a while. D did you hear their voices at any point after, after you let go of them? Uh, no, no. Not at all? No, not at all. But this is what Mark Newman told the police. We then fell over and then Cindy was swept away in the water and I could hear her for a little while yelling out, Daddy. You told the police in your first interview that when the children slipped out of your hands, you heard one of them calling out to you, calling Daddy. 
Now, when we spoke yesterday on the spot where it happened, you said you didn't hear anything. You didn't hear any of them, either of them say anything at all. So no. which, which, which is the truth? No, well, I, I didn't remember hearing anyone calling out to me. So he may or may not have heard the children. Remember, he told us it was a life and death struggle trying to save them. But Pam's version of that struggle, once again, is quite different. It's the most chilling allegation of all, as she told Mary Moroni and the police. And then she said he went down in the water and he was there for a little while. And then when he came up, he didn't have the children with him. The mystery of how two little girls died could remain just that, a mystery. But whatever the truth, something drove Mark Newman to attempt suicide just five weeks after the drownings. He tried to kill himself in the home of his friends, the Carlins. They asked him why. He said, because I'm a murderer. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, murdered two kids. Uh, I killed the two kids or something. Uh, but the words that he used was, I should be in jail, and then, because I'm a murderer. After your suicide attempt, are you sure you didn't say anything about the events of that night? No. You didn't say anything like, I should be in jail? No. You telling the truth? I'm positive. How do you suggest that I make sense of all of this? You tell me one thing, and a whole range of other people tell me something else. How do I decide? Well, I don't know. That's up to yourself on how you judge the facts. Do you care how anybody else judges the facts? Yes. How would you like to be seen by people? Um, just as a, a normal person that um, was involved in a... In a, in a severe accident, because that's all it was. We're happy to provide police with a contact for the missing witnesses, the Carlins. Their testimony might have been of considerable interest at the recent inquest. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.